Thank you. All right, it is my privilege to welcome Alex Jones to the Bush School of Business. Alex is the CEO and co-founder of Hallow, a Catholic prayer and meditation app. He was raised Catholic, but fell away from his faith at a young age. He became fascinated with secular meditation, but kept feeling that he was being pulled towards something spiritual. As he explored this curiosity, he discovered the deep, completive, and meditative tradition uh, in the Catholic faith. And as I'm sure he will tell you, it changed his life, brought him back to the faith, and was the inspiration behind Hallow. Hallow is only two, point five, two and a half years old, but by the grace of God and a phenomenal team, he has grown it to the number one Catholic app in the world, uh, with over one million downloads and 30,000 five-star reviews. Alex grew up in Columbus, Ohio, went to undergrad at the University of Notre Dame, and the graduate school at Stanford. Prior to founding Hallow, Alex worked in the consultancy McKinsey & Company. He now lives in Chicago with his wife and new daughter. Please join me in welcoming Alex Jones. So I want to start off um, sort of picking up from the bio with your story, right? You have this fascinating story. Could you give us an overview of your journey going from, as we said, being raised Catholic to sort of falling away from the faith and, and not just coming back, but, you know, building this company that was inspired by your sort of return to faith? Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you hit on, it feels a little you guys hear in the back? Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay, I'll just keep a little quiet. That's good. I'm the contemplative guy anyway. Um, so you hit on most of the story there. Raised Catholic, fell away from my faith, would have considered myself atheist or agnostic for most of high school and, and undergrad. Um, and got really into meditation when I graduated and started working in the real world. Uh, unfortunately, my mind did not first go to St. Teresa of Avalon, St. John of the Cross, but uh, like secular meditation in Eastern traditions. I was about to book a trip to India for a couple weeks to try to learn how to meditate, and I ended up finding Headspace, which had just launched, uh, which was a much cheaper solution than a flight to India. Um, and I used it every day for two, three years, and I thought it was an awesome tool to learn this technique of meditation in the comfort of your own home. You could pick your guide, pick your length, 10 minutes before you went to work or whatever. Um, and I thought it was awesome, but every time in, in mindfulness meditation, you focus on your breath for a while, and then at the end, you kind of let your mind go. And every time I would let my mind go at the end, um, it would feel pulled towards something spiritual, the Trinity, an image of the cross, the Holy Spirit, which I thought was very strange, because uh, I would have considered myself agnostic. So I started talking to priests, brothers, sisters, friends who I knew who were deeper in my faith life, thinking I had some sort of revolutionary <laughs> question of, hey, is there any way that there's some sort of intersection between meditation and the faith world? And they all laughed at me and said, yeah, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. You probably should have heard about it. Uh, that's why it's <laughs> called prayer. And I had obviously known, you know, growing up as a Catholic, known about prayer, the, you know, stuff that I had memorized as a kid, or the, hey, thanks for stuff, sorry for stuff, help me with stuff. But I had always just felt like I was either talking in my own head or just repeating things that I had memorized. And there was some priests who, um, said, okay, imagine, Alex, if, if you went home every day to, I think Megan would have been my fiancé or something at the time, uh, my wife now, and if you went home every day and you said, hey, I'm thankful for this, I'm sorry for this, and could you help me with this, good night, um, how healthy would your marriage be? And I was like, not very healthy. And he's like, why? I was like, well, most of my day is, hey, honey, how was your day? And then I sit and listen for an hour or two. And uh, he was like, yeah, now imagine if you were talking to the creator of the universe when you want to listen more than talk. Uh, and so I started learning all about these really deep contemplative meditative techniques within the church, nation spirituality, Lexia Vina, um, Carmelite spirituality and recollection, chant, all this stuff that honestly I've never heard of before. And so I googled how to do Lexia Divina, which is a way of meditating uh, using a word that sticks out to you from scripture, and opened up a Bible that was laying around to Matthew 6, and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is the word that stuck out that I meditated on, and just changed my life, brought me to tears, brought me back to my faith, the most important part of who I am now, taking the Mass Confession, all the fun parts about the faith. Um, 
but it's just this beautiful combination of this deep sense of peace. And you can get that a little bit in secular meditation, like you feel your stress levels go down, you're sitting still, you're breathing. Um, but combined with this depth of meaning and purpose, so hallowed means to make holy, does that mean Jesus is making God the Father's name holy? Is, am I supposed to make God's name holy? Is he making me holy? Am I letting him make me holy? Uh, am I supposed to be helping other people grow in holiness? And so anyway, I know it was just this awesome combination of, of this depth of meaning and purpose and struggle with this deep sense of peace. Uh, and so I knew that I needed to do this for the rest of my life. I loved kind of the format of the Headspace Calm apps. And so I learned how to, I knew how to code a little bit. I learned how to code a, in Swift, which is the iOS language, and we um, built the first version of Test Suite and we um, shared it with a few folks, maybe you know, 50, 100 folks of our friends and family, and were just blown away by uh, what God was able to do just in those small few instances of uh, reaching out to folks and having them create a place of silence. And that was, those, uh, I don't, I need to update my bio more often. Uh, so that was three and a half years ago or so, um, maybe three years ago, and we've just been blown away ever since. It's been incredible to get to journey for me personally, along with the, like how the community is just a really selfishly fun thing to do of like, oh, you hear something cool, five weeks, five months a year, and bishop during sermons or whatever, and it's like, okay, yeah, let's try to share this with folks. Um, while growing myself spiritually, watching God impact, we get notes from folks every day on crazy miracles that God has been able to do in people's lives, suffering with depression, addiction, all this stuff, and um, to be able to reach more folks than we ever thought possible, which has been a, a tremendous blessing. So, so yeah, but that's that's my story. Outstanding. So, um, I want to dig into this idea of community here in a minute, but this is a business school, and so I want to uh, discuss a little bit more in detail um, your your journey that you took through building this business, right? So as you said, and I guess it's you know three to four years now, right? Um, still a very short time. You've taken this from essentially a good idea to um, the you know, number one Catholic app advertisements for parishes all across the country. Can you give us some insight both into how you launched this company and then how you scaled so quickly? Yeah. Um... There's a bunch of stuff there. Uh, the first thing is like the, the, the overarching theme of this and the overarching theme of my experience with Hallow has just been how like tactically God has worked uh, through it um, and with building the startup and hiring the team. And like, you, you think like, oh yeah, let go and let God take control or whatever. But actually we, when we try and do something real hard and then we finally just give up, he does it in like half a second as soon as we're like, all right, God, you just do this. And then he does it in half a second. So anything good and all the awesome content additions or growth spikes or, or any of that stuff has just been uh, incredible to say, uh, to, to watch what God has been able to do. There was a, there was a time, uh, so we like, so we launched three and a half years ago, I guess December of, end of December of 2018, um, and then we did like our, our first, we started as a startup, Public Benefit Corporation, which is a way for us to still raise funding, but uh, have written into our legal charter uh, the social mission as opposed to just the um, shareholder value thing that most startups have. Um, and anyway, so we did our, our seed rounds maybe like two years ago or so, um, the, uh, our Series A like a year ago, and then our Series B like six months ago. But at the seed, I was super stressed. You have to go meet with all these like Silicon Valley VCs, you meet with like 70 people. You met with a bunch of faith angels too. Um, but you need like two people to be kind of excited about it. I had probably like 80 meetings in a week, maybe two weeks. And we had one person kind of excited about it, but you want a competitive round. So you want like it just at least one other person. If, if there's two, you can make it feel like there's 80, but it just has to be one other. And so I remember I was going back to my room and I sat down, I was super stressed because all I, like at a startup when you're just meeting with somebody, they're just judging you because you don't really have a product or maybe like a few thousand people were using the app or whatever. But um, a very small community, and so they're really just judging like you as a person and how you act, and they're like, yeah, I don't like you, or I do like you, and so let me back you. And so it's a really stressful experience as a founder. And so at the end, I remember going back to my room with my wife, uh, studio, this tiny little studio apartment in Menlo Park, asking, talking to God, and I was just like, look, man, if this thing works, it's definitely your, like you get the credit for this thing for sure. Like I'm not gonna take the credit for that. Uh, but if it fails, it's on you too. Like I'm not, I'm not taking the blame for that. So it's, I'm gonna try, but it's on you if it fails. And which was actually like the the theme of starting it has been uh, that, which is like just letting go. Um, 
But anyway, the I mean the tactical stuff. At the beginning, there's like there's a bunch of different types of startup founders. There's folks who just find a market and find an opportunity and build something great and talk to users and all that stuff. And then there's folks who have the experience themselves or the problem themselves. Uh, and that's been my experience, which has been so a lot easier uh, because I just get to I use the app every day, so I know whether there's a bug in the app uh, multiple times. I you know can think of okay, would I find that content interesting or whatever. So at the beginning, it's just. I guess the three questions I had right at the beginning was, hey, is this a need? I knew it was a need for me. Is it a need for anybody else? Uh, can we build something that helps somewhat to solve the need? And then can we make it, can you scale it? Can it be, is there a model, some sort of economic model that works to grow it? Um, and that's what we did. We did like a couple beta tests and then we launched with our subscription model with a bunch of free content and then uh, the upgrade to the subscription model. And it worked really well. And the beginning was kind of really focused on building a product and content that kept people. The, it's called product market fit. You want like the you want people to keep using the thing forever. You don't want them to start using it and then stop using it. So retention was super important at the beginning. And that was really the focus of the first year. It's like content retention. We had a little bit of growth stuff from you know emails that would go out or folks who would share it. And then over the last couple of years, once you start to get that down a little bit, it's a lot more of okay, how do you reach out to folks? So that's, we partnered with a lot of really incredible folks, influencers or content creators, uh, sponsoring shows, advertisements, parishes, all that stuff, which has worked really well. And it's just about how do you figure out a way that um, you can scale those types of things, whether through organic sharing and morality, or you know you pay an ad and somebody signs up for a subscription, so it pays back the ad. Um, so a bunch of stuff, but really the focus at the beginning was retention and making sure you had a solid product and then scaling uh, over the last probably two years or so. Great. Can we dig into this, um, how you design the product then? Um, because again, we're a business school. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this with, we've all seen Catholic apps before. Most of them are filled with lots of great intentions and then poor design and maybe lack of functionality. That's, I've used uh, Halo myself, clearly not the case with, uh, with Halo. So what were you thinking of from a sort of design thinking perspective? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, I had the same experience, which is, like, if you talk to someone who's, you know, especially someone, like, below the age of 30, and you're like, hey, you should check out this app, and uh, it looks not great, uh, maybe it doesn't function like a normal app, and it, it just looks like it's low quality, it was built, like, eight to ten years ago, even if it has incredible content on it, they just, you won't download it. It's like, nah, that just doesn't look like something I would download, and which is sad, because it's, the content of the church and of contemplative prayer and meditative prayer is rich and beautiful of saints' lives. There's so much beauty in the church and in the content that the app deserves to be the same. You can see it in like beautiful churches, right? Like a, the what is happening within the church is beautiful, and the church itself should should mirror that fact. And within the digital world, we felt very strongly to to work hard to try to build something that would seem high quality to folks and rival the best designed apps in the world. Unfortunately. I am not an artist or a designer, and so we launched the first version of the app, and it was terrible. If anybody wants to go look up old photos of it, it was all purple. I had this big thing with like St. John the Cross and mountains, so there were mountains everywhere, and really annoying stuff, and it was terrible looking. We brought on this designer, which actually is another theme. Uh, I also coded the first version, so we brought on the developer, and he said, hey, Alex, I'd love to help you out, uh, but do you mind if I take a week and delete all your code and rewrite it? <laughs> and uh, then our designer came on, he's like, I was like, okay, all I need is like, I need to add like 10 more chapters of content to this thing, so I need some sort of navigation thing. And he's like, okay, that's fine. Do you mind if I take like two weeks and just work on something totally different and you still pay? He's like, well, I'm paying me off my personal credit card from my retirement savings account, so not really, but fine, go ahead and take the, the two weeks. And he did, and he came up with all these like really beautiful illustrations with different colors and all this stuff. and. Uh, it was just incredibly well done. So the, the only thing that we've been able to do well there uh, is just have really phenomenal people working on it. Uh, and you, you know, like, I guess my only, the only thing that I know is, like, I know when I see something, if it's crap or if it's decent or if it's somewhat good, and which is my job now. Um, but they, he, like Sean, our, our main designer, just did an incredible job of just taking it and building a brand and an experience that was welcoming and approachable and felt really high quality himself. So. There's always a super important um, thing, but the, having the right people around the table is what did it. That's great. Can we um, talk about the people then, right? So I can tell just by speaking with you that 
mission is very important to what you do in the company. Um, if you've taken a class with me, you probably have heard me do an aside on this. You mentioned that the governance structure is what they call benefit corporation. So unlike a traditional C corp, you actually build your values in, you bake your values into the company basically, right? It's, it's a bigger bottom line than just profit. So, so this is clearly important to you. How did you build a team that was both skilled, right, had these necessary um, expertise to build the app, and also uh, sort of inculcated in the culture you're trying to develop? Yeah, I'll get to the, the tactics of it. Um, again, the same thing that I was saying before, uh, Big Man did all the heavy lifting. Like an example of that is, uh, we were, I was talking with one of, my, one of the co-founders who um, neither of us have good voices, like you wouldn't want to meditate with my voice, it's not super soothing. And, um, and we don't know what we're talking about. I'm not a theology degree. I have no idea how to pray or anything. So I have a decent sense now. But the uh, so we were on the phone, and I was about to go into mass, and I was like, you know, what we really need is just somebody with just a, like a beautifully sexy voice, and who knows what they're talking about with faith and spiritual. Like I would look to as a spiritual director. And I went into mass, received the Eucharist, and then was sitting there praying. And this guy's name Francis. This guy's name just popped into my mind. I had only met him once in undergrad. And I reached out to a friend of a friend who knew him and was like, hey, I knew it was in seminary. And I was like, hey, do you mind if uh, can I pitch Francis on this? And he was like, yeah, what's the idea? So I told the friend the idea. He had Francis over for dinner the next night. And Francis was like, I'm 175% committed to this. You don't even have to pitch me on it. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. The <laughs> best pitch I've ever done. Um, but really finding the folks on the team was, was, uh, was pretty similar to that. The, like our main engineer, um, one of our co-founders knew a, a developer in Silicon Valley who's, who had worked for a few startups, and he said, hey, he wasn't, he wouldn't, we tried to hire him, he wouldn't let us. And he said, I do know somebody who could work for a contract, and uh, he's the, I've worked with probably 100 engineers, and he's the only one who's better than me. And so we reached out to him. I tried to do like this coding test, because I read in grad school that the only reliable way to like decide if somebody's good is to have them actually do work. And he was, I was like, hey, could you do this coding test? And he was like, nah. Sorry, it's not worth that. I got a lot of work. I got a lot of projects that I can take. And I was like, okay, can I hire you anyway? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, the designer did the same thing, um, which is not good for anybody who's interviewing for Howard because we still we do have those tests now. But the um, but anyway, so he's been phenomenal. One of the best hires we've ever had. Um, very similar to you know our audio engineer, we found randomly through some freelance thing. There's public.com does a bunch of freelance stuff, and he was just super jazzed about the mission and just did incredibly high quality audio editing work. Um, but yeah, for us, it's 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 incredibly important. I learned a decent bit at McKinsey of how to interview folks and try to figure out if um, people were anywhere decent at, at what they were trying to do, and so. Uh, we did have a pretty rigorous interview process to try to have folks be super high quality, but then once you find somebody who's just a, an all-star, just trying to keep them and, and grow them and develop them and have them build out teams through their own network because they attract all sorts of high quality folks. So um, so yeah, we've been incredibly lucky. Last year we were like 10 folks, and then now we're roughly like 42 or 45, and so it's it's uh, it's been on, which is still actually really small for the state of our company, but. Um, they're all just incredibly capable people, so it's been a blessing to get to work with. And the mission for us is an incredible advantage. Like it's, uh, like if you just if we reach out to all the Silicon Valley people, a good chunk of them are going to get turned off by the Catholic startup idea. Um, but the people who are jazzed about it are really jazzed about it. Like to find something where you can work at a high-paced, high-quality tech um, company that pushes you and grows more than you could grow in any other career whatsoever. Uh, while at the same time you get to work on something faith related and get to impact people in this incredibly personal part of their life uh, is a dream come true for me and a bunch of the folks on the team. And so it does, you know, and, and now we have the benefit of being able to, when we hire for jobs, we can just email, you know, the two, two and a half million folks who have signed up for the app and just say, hey, we've got some jobs. Do you want to, does anybody want to apply? Everybody wants to be a voice on the app. So whenever we add a new voice, <laughs> we get like, 3,000 applicants or so, uh, so we should start a new little American Idol for prayer. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's been a, a real advantage to have the mission and have folks who are excited about it um, to build that team. So let's talk about that community that you're building around the app now. So what are the secrets of the tools you've used to build the culture among your community? Um, how, how do you get users to invite family and friends and sort of spread the good word, so to speak? Um, 
Yeah, that's, I mean, it's probably the most important part of building a consumer startup is um, figuring out how folks on the app invite other folks uh, and share it. I mean, there's a few things. The content is incredibly important. So, you know, Father Mike does an incredible job of creating a ton of really phenomenal content. Bishop Barron does an incredible job. Scott Hans, Mr. Miriam, Jonathan Rooney, uh, Kabizel, all these folks. There's you, you have to continue to try to build a library of content that's really high quality and engaging. Because um, that's like, you know, if anybody signs up for Disney Plus, it's not because you're like, oh my gosh, the app interface on Disney Plus is so amazing. It's because you want to watch the show uh, or Netflix or Apple TV or whatever it is. Um, and that's for, for how to the vast majority of people sign up because they want to do the Lenten challenge or the Advent challenge or any of that jazz. Um, the app itself is super important to try to build those. It's like when someone has the inkling to share it, how can you make that as easy as possible? So they listen to a session, they reflect on it, and it's like, hey, I really want to share this session with somebody. How can you make that process as easy as possible? For us, prayer and faith is a community thing. Uh, it's important to do it with other people. So we try to build that into the app um, as much as possible. Not in a way that's like, you know, a Facebook feed with likes or um, hearts or arguments or whatever, but like, uh, you know, me and my mom in a group together, and I can see her reflection, or I can say, hey, could you pray for this thing for my daughter or whatever it is. Um, so building that stuff into the app is incredibly important. But, I mean, the most, the most impactful part is just people, people's individual experiences with, um, with the app. Like, when people have a transformational experience with God through the app, they just become these, uh, they just end up sharing it more than you could ever, like, posting it all on these Facebook groups or going to parishes and just, uh, you know, asking different priests to go and, and give a talk after a homily. And, and when you have those types of experiences, um, or so our goal is just to help folks to grow in that relationship with God and try to have those types of experiences, which has been phenomenal. We have, you know, there's somebody who, all these incredible stories of folks on the app, but there's somebody who had a friend who had seven days left to live and had never prayed before and was too intimidated to pray. Uh, and so they were able to use the app for the last seven days of their life to pray a rosary, which is just like an incredibly beautiful story. There's somebody who's dealing with anxiety and depression, um, people who are dealing with body image issues who are able to come to the app and find some sense of peace, uh, people dealing with addiction or divorce or you know, terribly difficult things, loss of love, losing loved ones, losing um, people in their family. And to be able to find some sense of hope and some sense of peace with God through, for us to be able to be a small part of that. And that ends up folks creating the community themselves, people in the app sharing it with their own parish once they have those types of powerful experiences. So, uh, common themes, it's all, all of JC doing the heavy lifting, but that's the big thing that's created the community. That's great. Um, so, you, you mentioned in your discussion of the community the content. Looking at this from a marketing standpoint now, did you come in with a target audience? Or were you the target audience, right? Or did you envision this larger community that you just described? How is it that you define your audience? Yeah, we don't, we don't really. I've been pretty bad at that. Um, like the classic marketing stuff. The, um, I mean, the, at the beginning it was just me. So like, what do I think would be cool? And then how do I reach out to what podcast am I listening to? How do I reach out to people who are somewhat like me. We realized very early on that it was not just me who was listening to the, um, who was finding value in the app. So like we have a spike of probably 18 to 25, maybe 18 to 30-ish year old is, is our biggest spike in terms of users. 18 to 24 and then 25 to 35. Um, so like young adults or young professionals uh, who are interested in growing deeper in their spirituality is our big spike. And that was our goal early on. Like most of the team is that kind of person, uh, although we come from all different places in our in our faith journey. But um, so that's what we built it for initially. But what we ended up seeing is, I mean, we have a pretty even distribution below 35, 35 to 55, and 55 plus. It's it's pretty much flat. Um, and what we saw is like moms who were worried their kids were going to grow up to be atheists were using it, or uh, people who just got married were using it, or people with uh, you know new moms or new parents who um, you know had young kids and were staying up late at night and needed something productive to do were using it. People who had just retired who were uh, 
um, you know, had more free time on their hands and were focused on growing in their spiritual life or, or finding value in it. People who were nearing the end of their own life and were, um, uh, you know, wrestling with the bigger questions were, were finding value to it. So for us, it, like, it started definitely focused on, hey, us, uh, but it's, it's grown quite a bit. And all we, um, the big thing that somebody told me early on uh, out in the valley that when you try to, uh, figuring out who your power users were was super important. And so we did, we did focus on that a good bit early on. And what we realized was it was either people who were already met it, because building a new habit is pretty hard. It, you, you end up dropping off. It's hard to like start working out. You end up doing it eventually, but it's really hard. The people who stick with it typically have another habit that they're either hacking it onto or replacing. And so the two big power users for us were people who were trying to meditate before using Headspace or Calm, but wanted to incorporate their spirituality somehow. Um, or people who were praying already, but wanted to build a better habit of prayer, grow deeper in their habit of prayer, felt like they were just going through the motions. And so those two, the latter skewed a little bit older and the younger, the, the former skewed a little bit younger, but those two types of groups of folks, people who were interested in the meditation thing, or people who were really focused on the prayer thing, it ends up being the same content. Lexidamine is essentially the same for both, but uh, different kind of hooks to get folks in. So let's uh, pivot then to content. How do you choose content? Um, there, there's the classic Lexidamine, um, but you've branched off into lots of different types of content. What goes into those decisions? What goes into the ideation? Yeah, early on we, we started with nine sessions in the app. Well, first we started with the Chance the Rapper audio file, which but uh, then we actually recorded sessions um, and there were nine sessions and one was like Christian meditation which is kind of like Carmelite recollection but just kind of core meditation focused on Jesus as simple come Holy Spirit thing or something like that or an imaginative prayer type thing but a, a just kind of a simple meditation thing the next three sessions were an exam uh, and the next three sessions were like Sidibian. and we launched the beta test and we were like this is going to be perfect because we're going to have 80 people do it and then we're going to interview them all and ask what they thought. And then we're going to pick the best one and build an examine app or build the Lexidamine app or whatever it ended up being. And we got incredible stories from folks. It was just nine pretty terribly recorded sessions. Actually, we ended up recording in the studio that uh, Post Malone recorded congratulations in, in Texas. It was just, we tried to do it in an apartment and then we were like, let's put the nearest studio. Um, but. So we had those nine sessions, incredible stuff. People gave us incredible, there was a woman who uh, discerned into, like a, a young woman in undergrad who sat through the nine sessions and was able to discern into religious life and break up with her significant other and, and commit to becoming a, a nun. Um, so incredible stories. But everybody was like, yo, the first three sessions were amazing, the next six were terrible. Or, you know what, these three sessions were phenomenal, the others were crap. Like, I don't even know why you had that in the app. And then, but the distribution of which one they liked was exactly even. It was only like 80 people, but it was like 33% loved Alexa Divina, 33% loved the meditation thing, 33% loved the exam. Which I, I was, at that time, pretty into the meditation thing, and I kind of switch every month or so. But it just, it just went to show, like early on, one of the big learnings for us was everybody is different in their different spiritual journeys, but also it changes for you on a given year or a given month or a given week or a given day. And so trying to build the content in a way that could be as diverse as possible to how different folks, where different folks were in their spiritual life and what was adding the most value. Because there's just an enormous breadth of content. So we, a lot of it is just, you know, hey, what do we think would be cool for sure, the content team. But a lot of it is user feedback or surveys or ideas or, um, of that stuff, listening as much as we can to users and seeing how they're using the app. We realized early on a lot of folks were using it at like 10 p.m., 11 p.m., so building out like a sleep section, something that was a little bit more peaceful at night for folks to close their days to. Uh, so it was just a lot of listening to the community that was on how and using it, how can we continue to build the content for them. So among your content, you have some, some really cool partnerships, right? So if you're to open the app right now, you're going to see a, a list of sort of a list of Catholic social media people, right? So you're gonna see Emily Wilson, Father Mike, Jonathan Rumi. How did you get these people to work with you? Well, is there a key to building sort of a team of talent? You don't think I, that people don't wanna work with me, is that? Um, <laughs> I want, so let, let me go <laughs> a little bit. You, you're very approachable, but um, did, did, do 
any of these people approach you? Right? Do you have any users of the app that say, you know, I want to be a part of this? Or is this you building out a network and, you know, that's synergistic to what you're doing? I mean, we're blessed now to where a, a good chunk of folks approach us, which is, um, so it shifts a little bit uh, as, as we're growing. But in the early days, it was just all block. I mean, really. The, I mean, we built a lot of the content ourselves. Um, Jonathan Rumi, if anybody hasn't seen the show, first off, if anybody hasn't downloaded the app, shameless plug to download the app. Um, how, H-A-L-L-O-W, it's on my shirt somewhere. Um, the, uh, also, if anybody hasn't seen The Chosen, you gotta download The Chosen app and watch The Chosen and change your life. Um, but my aunt like sent me this message, I'd been working on this thing for three, six months or so, and she sent me a message, she was like, you gotta watch The Chosen. And it, the first season had just come out. And she sent me all types of religious stuff, and it's usually terrible. And so I was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna watch The Chosen. And then she sends me another message, she was like, you have to watch The Chosen. And I was like, okay. And so I, I, I didn't watch it, actually, for like a, a solid couple months. And one of my co-founders, ex-girlfriends, uh, knew Jonathan through something. Like he went to their church or something. They're like, hey, maybe he would, you know, want to create a Bible story at night for the app. And I was like, okay, I don't know who this guy is or what The Chosen is, but I'm sure he plays Jesus in something, so that seems interesting. And so we reach out, and he's like, yeah, I record it. So then he's recording it. Then I have to watch The Chosen. It changes my life. It's beautiful. He, he does an incredible job. The whole the whole Chosen team does an incredible job. Um, and he ended up recording like an initial story. Folks loved it, absolutely. Um, like the Sermon on the Mount, which was phenomenal. It started off, he, he the Sermon on the Mount started, he started with the temptation in the desert from the devil, and he had a devil voice. Uh, it was really creepy. And I was like, dude, you can't fall asleep for like an evil devil voice. Right there, you know? but, um, but anyway, then the sermon was, was phenomenal. It's like Jesus' voice, which was really well done. Um, but, and so then we just kept working. It, 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 we did another piece of content together, and we continued to do more and more content together, and folks just loved it. And the Chosen continued to take off, and, and it was phenomenal to be able to be like an early part of that. Father Mike was another example of those. Like, I was a massive fan of Father Mike. I tried reaching out to him like 30 different ways, and just nothing, just silence. And I was like, whatever, God, you know, if you don't want Father Mike to be on this thing, then that's fine. And then he just randomly emails us through like some contact us form or something. And he was like, hey, so I'm gonna do that. I, mean, I would love to do something for it. Uh, and so he did a story and then Ascension was like, hey, uh, we're doing this thing. I don't know if it'll be a big deal, but like five linear podcast, I don't know if you guys want to put it on the app, but we're gonna launch it in like a month. And uh, which again, heavy plug for that on the Howl app. Um, the, uh, and we're like, sure, yeah, seems like it would be a good idea. And it ended up being like the number one podcast in the world when it launched for like, you know, eight weeks or whatever, something crazy. And then it was again this year. And so uh, it was a bunch of a bunch of really lucky interactions. But it, I mean, the important part for for those, especially for like Father Mike or Bishop Aaron or, or uh, Dr. Hahn or any of those folks, it is really, I mean, there's a bunch of people trying to build stuff. And, and um, I think that the thing that worked the best was just like, it is really our authentic, and my mission is to try to help share this stuff with as, as many folks as possible. And so it is, I mean, it's it's mostly a relationship building thing to try to say, hey, are you gonna end up being some, my namesake isn't necessarily the best namesake to have, although it gets clicks on a YouTube video. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's just like, how can you build trust with folks that, you know, you're gonna try to take their, their brand and, and the church uh, and the content that they've created and, and share it with folks in an authentic way. So uh, that's been what we've been trying to do forever and just continuing to form new partnerships with folks. Do you have a, do you have a creative team? Do you have a process um, around basically keeping the content fresh, right? So you have a lot of initiatives um, recently around uh, Lent. You have your Lent in 40, I think, or Pray 40. Um, what goes into sort of keeping the content fresh? And, and building that? Yeah, we have, a, we have an awesome team. There's a probably five or six uh, theology folks on the team now who are writing, creating content, and figuring out new partnerships. We have kind of prayer and meditation stuff, which a bunch of those challenges. We have a bunch of guest stuff that we work with phenomenal folks on. We have Bible stuff, scripture stuff, and then we have music stuff. And so continuing to add content in all of those categories and try to share new and create new and beautiful content. Uh, we're like barely scratched the surface of the stuff that's available in the church. and so. It's really just a, a method of how do you prioritize all the stuff that you could create. Um, 
Um, the community challenge stuff, we try to keep, you know, each month we're creating something new for folks to kind of journey through the app and discover new content together. Uh, and then we kind of just sit around and say, okay, what we've heard from users, the, uh, we have an amazing faith advisory uh, group of folks who give us a good chunk of ideas. And so how can we try to take all of this beauty and, and spirituality within the church and share it with folks and try to create it as, as quickly as possible? The nice part for us is like, if you're a news company or even Netflix, uh, like you have to come up with new stuff every day because the and that gets pretty expensive. And for us, the nice part is like the church scripture doesn't really change, although the USCCB comes out with a new translation once every like 150 years. Um, but, uh, and like the rosary's not gonna change hopefully uh, for the next thousand years or whatever. And so we can create that and folks will just use it every day. And so the, the library for us um, continues to build on itself. And so then actually the hard part is from a product perspective, how do you make that discoverable and not overwhelming? Um, which is, you know, gets harder as you continue to add more content. But, uh, but yeah, we try to keep new stuff coming out every two, four weeks or so as, as quickly as we can. Great. I wanna um, shift gears now and talk about the business environment that you've been navigating since uh, a start in 2018 puts you in, in a weird part of world history, right? So we had the pandemic, and now we have some events in the world, such as what's happening in Ukraine. Can you speak, A, to say how the pandemic has impacted uh, your business model, right? And then B, from a content perspective, how do you sort of you know, find the right thing to say in the way that you're framing what you're doing in the app, you know, for example, the, the war in Ukraine? Yeah. Um... I mean, the pandemic, the first on the pandemic point, so we had started maybe, I guess it would have been like a year and a month or two before the pandemic. And we saw a bunch of folks really excited about it. The idea of like folks who were interested in spirituality or meditation or building a habit of prayer, I think transcends any current event. But the pandemic for us, we saw a massive spike. Uh, and the pitch was kind of, you know, hey, we're stuck inside. You can get addicted to Netflix or you can be sad or you can get sick of your family or you could use it as an opportunity to enter into a retreat like just be a monk if you're stuck in a cell you might as well try to be a monk for a little bit it's a cool experience um and folks found that really valuable we had came out with like a bunch of stuck at home stuff and all that jazz uh and then easter happens uh the first easter when we weren't able to go to mass in person and so trying to come up as a digital resource with as much content as we possibly could for folks through that easter that first Easter season was a big, a, another big push. Um, and then I, I, as the pandemic continued on, a bunch of folks dealing with kind of losing loved ones or nearing the end of their own life or struggling with uh, illness or stress or anxiety, uh, able to find some sense of peace in, in uh, the pandemic and then, or in the app um, during the pandemic. And then towards the end, as folks were, uh, a ton of division online, hating different people for different reasons, being tired of uh, the pandemic, being able to come to a place that we could all come together over the rosary or scripture or stuff that doesn't divide us uh, was what we found um, to be pretty valuable. And for the current event stuff, I mean, the, the easy part is we don't. I, it's not like, hey, Alex, what do you think of the war in Ukraine? I just quote Pope Francis and just like, hey, this is the guy, so we're just going to read what he says. Um, uh, or, you know, from church fathers or scripture or whatever. So it's the, for us, when we see these things, what we try to do is we're trying to create the, an app that like, will be a miracle if we pull it off, but maybe that Democrats and Republicans could both come to and pray. Uh, and so we don't try to do, like we try, when, whenever there's a big current event, although we should have, uh, this is being recorded, so maybe I shouldn't make this joke, but we should have Will Smith and, and Chris Rock on to have like a <laughs> they can pray together I think that'd be beautiful but um, the anyway we try to pick current events where like everybody's kind of saying the same thing like you watch CNN you watch Fox News and it's kind of like okay we're kind of this isn't like a super political thing we're kind of agreeing here um, and then how can we pray through it so not like you know what do I think we should do in the war in Ukraine or what like policy should be but how can we pray for the people experiencing war all across the world all across the world and especially in how can we pray for peace and how can we, um, you know, as, as Pope Francis, I forget exactly what he did, but he dedicated, I think, the, one of the Marian feasts recently to the people of Ukraine and Russia, and so how can we help pray for that? Um, and so how can we try to bring folks together in prayer through these things that 
can very quickly become divisive and just try to pray for folks and for God to do his will. Outstanding. All right, so um, final question, and I think we'll have a little bit of time left over for questions from our students. Um, you've given us a couple throughout the, the interview, but could you highlight some uh, examples of um, users who, who lives have been changed Ways that this has had not just a you know you know technology impact where it makes people's lives easier, improves their prayer life, but has sort of changed their lives towards God for the better. Yeah, and there's a bunch of we get a note about every day that makes me cry, which I'm becoming a softie with kids. Um, but the I mean the biggest one for us was we had launched the app as a beta test, and then we launched it. Anybody wants to hear the story of our initial launch, we grab a drink later, but it was the most stressful day of my life. Um, the whole app crashed like four hours before I told everybody that it was supposed to launch. And there's only one thing, like if you're Robin Hood, you can lose a bunch of people's money and piss them off. There's only one thing Hal can do that makes you really, really mad, which is if you pay for the plus thing, we don't give you the plus thing. And it just totally didn't work. And then your phone became totally white. Like, I've never seen that happen before. Anyway, we fixed it. Um, but we launched the beta test in like this early December of 2018, and my aunt, um, who actually told me about the chosen, uh, my cousin, her son, her only son, had just passed away. He was 45 or so. Um, he had just gotten married. They had just gotten pregnant with his first child, and he passed away suddenly in his sleep uh, on a heart condition thing. And she, uh, she didn't get out of bed, wasn't eating for three, four, or five months. And she sent us a note, she started using, we, we had launched for like 12 days or so. Um, and we had like a little advent collection of prayers that we were going through with the advent season. And she had sent me an email that said, uh, I wish I had saved to this day, but the, that said, you know, this, Alex, just wanted to let you know, this, you know, this, Christmas season, this Advent season was, I was incredibly stressed and anxious and looking to, looking forward to with an immense sense of dread. It's always a time of anxiety where I have to figure out, um, you know, how to see my grandkids, how to see my kids, how to get gifts, how to travel to people. And for this year to be facing it um, without my son, um, I don't know how, I didn't think I was going to be able to get through it. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know that the Advent meditations that I've been doing each morning through the app have been the thing that have gotten me through it. And I've been able to focus on the meaning of the season and the hope and the peace that Christ brings into my life. And I just wanted to thank you. And I like still cry when I tell that story. Uh, but I just like broke down and like fell on the floor and was like, man, if I spend all my money and all my time and that was the only thing that I ever did, like positive ROI infinitely. And, uh, and we just get stories like that from folks in their life every day, like just incredible stories of how God has been able to use this space that you can create within your phone and within your day, just take five, 10 minutes, and how he's able to, to change, your, change your life through it. Uh, and so it's, it's been an enormous blessing for us to be able to be a part of and to hear how God is able to work through this simple tool um, into people's lives and to help change it for hopefully the better. So we'll see where, where the big man takes it, but it's been a blessing. Standing. Thank you. Um, I've had you speaking for about 50 minutes straight now, so would you be open to uh, yeah, for sure. I talk all the students. All day uh, students all out, outstanding. So if there are any students that have um, questions, uh, we have a microphone uh, in, I think, on both sides. Uh, so we have one down here in front. Firstly, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, it's been such a blessing to hear you speak. Um, my name is Robbie Cruz, and I'm a student here. Um, my question is, I'm assuming you're a pretty busy person, and I'm curious, so how do you make time to go to Mass? How do you make time to go to pray when you're as busy as you are? And do you work on Sundays? And if so, how do you incorporate Mass on Sundays when you're so busy? Those are good thank questions. You. Um, I think my spiritual director said, or I think it was St. Jose Maria Scream, but um, it was like, when I'm too busy to do my rosary, I need to do two, uh, which I, I actually think is pretty, 
actually don't, like, the cool thing for me is I look back on the last, like, three years, and there's, like, eight things that have happened that have, like, really driven how to success. I probably did, like, 4,000 things, like, little things that I thought would help. And there's been, like, eight of them that were, like, really impactful. Uh, and most of them God did. But, uh, like, that understand, that realization, especially in the past, of, like, just focusing, how can you focus on the things that are the highest priority? Make sure that you do them incredibly well. Um, uh, has been really helpful for me from a time management and a prioritization thing. I have, like, a... I've tried like 40 different to-do task things or whatever, Asana and Motion, just a paper notebook and a bunch of stuff. But really the key for startup lands has just been like, how can you try to ruthlessly prioritize? Like you're never gonna get, you're gonna have, I have a list of probably like 400, 500 tasks each week, and I probably get like 50 done. And so just like, how can you really ruthlessly prioritize? But, I mean, there's just a really great, there's a daily mass, like a 615 daily mass that um, is phenomenal, I can go. Uh, before like work starts essentially. And then I spend like 15, 20, uh, my spiritual director has been incredibly helpful. Like the three big things for my day each day to try to make sure that I, I do, which don't actually take that much time. It's just like a daily mass, a uh, like 20-ish minutes in silence, um, and then a rosary, and uh, which you can do all except the mass on how. Um, the, uh, but, so I, I spend like 20, and that's like 7, 15 a.m. or so, you get done with mass and 20 minutes of silence. Uh, and daily mass is pretty quick. Um, and, except I have a Polish priest who speaks for like 30 minutes whenever he gives an homily, so that was a little bit tougher. But the, um, but so then at 7, 15, I spend like 30 minutes with my family, and then, um, and then I work all day, and then I take like a, the rosary actually at, at night has been, Incredibly helpful as like a reset, like at the end of the day to like, okay, now I can spend some time with my, my daughter and my wife and then I you know, do a, a bit more work at night. Um, and then I go to bed at a decent hour and get time to sleep. But it, it really is like, okay, for me, trying to cut out as much of like procrastination or wasted time as humanly possible. Um, trying to prioritize those. I really only hit that daily habit probably like 60-ish percent of the time. So, you know, I'm a lot better than I was, but still not, not where I want to be. Uh, and then Sundays I do, I try to take, uh, I try to take a day off, uh, either it's Saturday or Sunday, but on Sundays I try to take every Sunday off, mostly just for family, because my wife and daughter deserve that. And with our, our, uh, like our motto at Hal is like, this is not, we're not priests and nuns, this is not our primary vocation, our primary vocation is our family, that's what God is calling us to do. And the fun thing about Hal is like, I guess like succeeding in the secular world is kind of oh, you gotta work real hard and do all the right things and try to succeed. At Hallow, going back to that, the prayer experience that I had, it really is God's thing, and he's either gonna make it work or not. And so, like, learning to let go uh, and trust in him and to do what he's asking us to do, which is prioritize our family, which is prioritize our prayer and spiritual life, um, has been the thing that we've been most focused on. Um, and if it, you know, if, if that wasn't true, then Hallow would all be a waste of time. Like, if prayer was a waste of time, would be a waste of time. So being able to prioritize that has been uh, incredibly important for my own spiritual life. But it's definitely not like it's definitely not easy. You just end up super busy and, and trying to figure out how you prioritize things effectively. So I don't know if I have a perfect answer, but no, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I think we have a question on this side. Hi. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, during COVID last year. Um, some of us were studying remotely or were here in person. I was someone who studied remotely. And um, like my whole degree is to work for my diocese back home in Utah. And something that we were able to offer through our parish, through a partnership with you guys for our parishioners as a ministry was someone, we got a donor to help us provide free access to your app. So firstly, I just wanted to thank you because we got lots of reviews through the parishioners on I was really helping them like stay alive and especially like Utah's mission territory. So like it was really just helping people um, stay alive spiritually and give them different things to think about and different ways to pray, especially just because it is hard to pray in those times of sadness, I think. Um, but my question kind of is, do you still continue those partnerships with individual parishes or like how does some of your, um, your outreach continue in similar ways like that, like very practically? Yeah, uh, thanks for, for the kind words.
is the, I mean, we're still pretty early in, in the, the partnership side of the stuff that we're doing. Um, the easiest one for us right now is schools. Uh, the median age of disaffiliation from the church is like 13, so it's a super important one for us. And uh, teachers are really hungry for something that they can use to help guide folks, their, their classes in, um, uh, in prayer and in their spiritual life. And so that's a really easy one that we're focused on. How can we serve as many schools, which end up being parts of parishes, uh, as, as quickly as possible? And then for parishes, we have a handful of things that we've tried. We've, we've done things like your parish where, uh, you know, there's an extended free trial or access for, um, you know, a period of time through a donor provided thing or uh, a parish paid for thing or something. The biggest thing for us in the parishes has just been folks who have used the app. Uh, the thing that's uh, been the most impactful has been people who have used the app within their parishes, either creating groups. We have little private groups within the app that you can create, either creating those groups or just sharing it with folks through, through their parish. We have like banners that we put up that are like 90% decoration for Easter or Lent, but then also, you know, if you want to pray every day, there's instructions on how to do it, like little handouts and stuff. And so that has been uh, super impactful for us to help share the app and for the folks. You know, it's like if you, if you have like a toaster that you really like, you maybe text a few people about it, but the really nice part of the church community is you have this kind of built-in referral network where if you really like something, you can go to your church and share it with the you know thousand families or whatever that are at your local parish. So that's been the biggest thing for us. But there's a lot more stuff that we're going to try to work on there with how can we plug priests into private groups and get them sharing content within their uh, private communities and how can we better connect schools and parishes and families and parents and students and all that stuff. So there's a lot of work there, but um, the big thing for us right now is just trying to reach out to parishioners and individuals' lives and try to help them build habits of prayer and grow in their spiritual life. All right, great. We had several other uh, questions. Let's do one uh, down here. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to come out and speak with us. Um, you didn't speak too much about your um, personal experience working for McKinsey and in the secular world. Um, I was just wondering how those skills at, that you learned at McKinsey and other companies that you may have kind of enriched this whole process, enriched your whole um, mission with this startup. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I loved McKinsey. I thought it was, if I were to work for a, something that wasn't Palo or a startup, it would definitely be McKinsey. I thought it was a phenomenal it was such a cool, like consulting is, uh, it's hard work, travel kind of sucks, but you get to work on really incredibly interesting and high level problems as a 23 year old or whatever, which is stupid. I don't know why they pay us for that, but the, um, but it's really, and why well, there's partners who are super, yada, 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 but the, uh, but it's really cool work. And so you get to, like I got to build a new product for a really giant company and test it. I got to help design that, I got to work on AI stuff, I got to work on like five year strategy stuff. Um, and so you get to do these projects that are, help you understand a bit about, you know, what it takes to try to build an organization. And I guess the biggest thing for me going into startup world was like two things. The one was, and, and they were actually the same, but it's just like not being afraid to do things, which does take a little bit of knowledge. Um, and on the technical side, so I was mechanical engineering in, in undergrad. And so that was like, okay, I know a little bit of how to code. And so if you were to tell me like, okay, you gotta code this app, I'm not like totally afraid. I don't know how to do it, but I feel like maybe I can learn. Um, or like audio editing or building a machine that says something or whatever, like it's not super intimidating. Um, and then on the business side, McKinsey was like, okay, whatever the problem is, whatever the big enough problem is, we can break it into parts and try to tackle it in a way that, you know, and I'm not super afraid of like a balance sheet or a financial model or whatever. Um, and so those things, those two things were incredibly important of like how do you, and that was the biggest thing at McKinsey is, is how do you break a problem down and try to solve it? Something that's like really hard, like what is a five year strategy for an insurance company? Like something I don't know anything about. But how do you, okay, so what, you know, how do we drive revenue? Where's revenue coming from currently? Costs, all that jazz. Uh, so that, that, those few things were super helpful. And then it's also a really great, so I was able to, I was like an analyst, I was an analyst for a, a year and a half and then an engagement manager for a year, year and a half. And so it's a really great um, leader.
leadership training thing of building new teams and learning how to get up to speed quickly and work with new people. Um, you Like in a regular job, you only do that once and then you kind of get used to working with people and then you work with them forever. In consulting, you do that every six to eight weeks. You work with a new group of folks. So you learn that like teaming process really quickly. I go back and forth on like straight out of undergrad, if it would have been better to just go straight into a startup or just start just try to start a startup or go into consulting, but um, but for me it was really incredibly helpful. Uh, and I actually didn't have to travel that much, so uh, it was pretty nice. Um, and loved uh, loved the firm in McKinsey. We have time for one more question, and I think there was a hand right in the center. I don't know if we can get a uh, microphone to you, maybe? Right, can you pass that across? Thank you. We're very cooperative. I know that one problem with technology is that it can be very addicting. And I know you said that some of your users are like using this app at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, so I was just wondering how has like the addiction factor like combined with the whole like idea of meditation, um, how has that affected the process of building your app? It's really interesting. I mean, we had somebody use the app like she had used it for a hundred times. She was actually an evangelical who had used it 300 times in a in, in hundred days. So she was using it like 30 times a day. Uh, now, I go back and forth. The vast majority of folks, what you're trying to do is build a habit, build a new habit, or build a kind of small but existing habit. So like my own journey was I didn't pray at all, or I you know, maybe had done the rosary once or twice, and so how do I build a, a consistent habit of, of the rosary? Um, and so the vast majority of our work is not, it's not like TikTok, it's not, it's not heavily addictive. Like the, the, doing a rosary is great, but like if you're sitting doing like 30 rosaries in a row and it's really hard for you to turn away from doing a rosary, you're, you're a special type of saint of a human being. Um, but the vast majority of our work is how do we, there's a, there's a bit of a difference between like entertainment, what, what I would call maybe like vice things, like entertainment things or things where you're kind of procrastinating or whatever, and like, Vitamins like like good things like meditation or working out like the, the working out apps and the, the meditation apps don't have the same like addiction issue as like Instagram Reels or TikTok or whatever does because um, the the much bigger issue is how do you most folks try to build that habit and can't most, like they, they fall off uh, and so how do you try to build a place that that makes it as healthy as possible and as easy as possible for you to build that habit um, no I mean like. If we ran into an issue where people were praying like 24 hours a day, it's kind of what monks and nuns do. Uh, obviously, you should spend time with your family, so that'd be super important. But I'd be pretty happy with a world where people are praying like five times a day, you know, like a priest or nun or whatever. So there's an there's an element of that helping people to pray as much as possible. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, we also have you know a bunch of do not disturb stuff. After each session, we kind of cut it so it's. It's not like it rolls into the next one like a TikTok or an Instagram Reels does. Um, and so we try to create like as healthy of a thing as possible. The last thing that I'd say is prayer is a bit different from meditation and working out in that like um, uh, it doesn't really matter if you do it, uh, if it doesn't lead to you serving other people. Like the, the, the fruit of prayer is love and if there's not, if you're not loving better then you're not praying. Um, and so like it is within each of our content, we try to drive people to, Palo is really not a replacement for the church. We're just trying to be a tool for the church. And so how can we drive people back to the church and back to serving our brothers and sisters in Christ and back to confession and back to mass and back to in-person community as much as possible? So we try to build that into the content and into the app as much as possible to connect folks and drive them outside of the app into service. I don't know if that makes sense, but I like it. All right. Alex, we are so grateful that you joined us. This has been a fascinating conversation. It's always amazing.